Let yourself feel the fear. In 2003, I chose a bizarre way to end my long-term opiate addiction. A psychedelic plant root called iboga helped me quit methadone once and for all. Oh. Oh, God, this is a strange substance. I wanted to find out more about iboga and work out whether it truly was a magic bullet to cure drug addiction. Over three years, I followed various addicts, treatment providers, and medical professionals who would hopefully give me the answer. Most active drug users cannot come out. You know, when you're on your arse and you're saying, my life's in tatters, my career's fucked, I feel worthless. What I've tried to do is try and get clean and stay clean. It's so fucking hard. <laughs> and I'm going to be do some magic and it's going to be good. <laughs> you're here now, you're done. Hey, There's no going back. Look, look, look! Look, he's having a seizure. He's having a seizure. They thought I, I'm, I'm hiding dead bodies in my garden. It doesn't want you to die, it wants you to live. It seems to me that it's the last chance saloon. This is the mid-80s. I'm experimenting with film and experimenting with drugs. Quite seriously, in fact. Serious enough to get myself a drug habit that would permeate my life for many years to follow. I had become aimless and felt empty. Crushing depressions marring my existence. I was drawn to the offbeat lifestyle of serious drug addicts, seeing it like a dark cult. I searched for something to alleviate my inner turmoil, and for a while, it actually seemed to work. I felt part of something, a junky subculture that was dark and foreboding, but somehow exciting at the same time. I'd been a heroin user for a relatively short part of my drug-using career. For most of the 17 years or so, I had opted for the government-approved method of opiate replacement therapy, methadone. I was firmly ensconced on this drug, which seemed like a godsend at first. That green liquid keeps me together. That is what keeps me together. But after a few years, I wanted off the stuff. The hellish withdrawal always got the better of me though and I felt trapped in the world of the legal junkie. This is methadone withdrawal. Oh, hell, I hate it. If this is day three, you imagine day four, day five, day six, day seven, and you know it isn't going to get any better. It's going to get worse, and the dreams and the visions and the pain of walking and talking and being just being alive is a complete and utter chore. Being alive just doesn't seem worth it. My brother had told me about a supposed wonder drug that seemed to be the real answer to my problems. Forest dwelling people in Gabon who followed the Bwiti religion have used the psychedelic root bark of the iboga plant for hundreds of years in a rite of passage ceremony. It was also quickly gaining a reputation in the West as a magic bullet to end addiction. I researched the subject intensely 
and came to believe that this bizarre substance could not only kill off the major withdrawal symptoms, which had always been a stumbling block for me, but could also initiate some psycho-spiritual experience and help me learn about aspects of my behaviour. A true catharsis, perhaps. Could I finally quit my methadone habit through one arduous psychedelic trip? But Iboga Detox has been linked to several deaths. Documentary maker may film his own death. These Sunday newspaper articles are pretty lurid. This is really concentrating on the very slight chance that I could be filming my own death. Yeah, it might seem crazy, but I know what I'm doing. Part of becoming a ghost. And when I come out of this and take it off, I'm no longer the ghost that I was. I'm not a methadone ghost anymore. And that's the idea. The psychoactive alkaloid of this plant I use is known as Ibogaine and in its more raw form as Iboga. Here we go. Oh god, this is a The detox trip was 36 hours of soul searching hell. I journeyed back into primitive states and saw myself from a different vantage point. Some of it terrifying and some of it very enlightening. Light and sound were being affected. The noise of the underground trains became amplified into squadrons of fighter aircraft flying through the roof of my skull. I felt the approach of something huge, something menacing perhaps. I then experienced a complete atomic breakdown. Deeper and deeper I went. Complex information was imprinted within my atomic structure. It related to life in the primordial swamp. And then it started to wear off after many hours, and I was back from the brink of complete cerebral annihilation but somehow refreshed and renewed. Thank God. Yeah. Intensity. The intensity is over. Yeah. My withdrawal symptoms from the drug I was addicted to were yeah, almost yeah. completely gone. I even got back to a normal sleep pattern fairly quickly. I truly felt elated that I'd beaten the habit. I'd gone through one of the most intensely gruelling but defining Cheers. moments of my life. Yeah. This psychedelic therapy yeah. certainly seemed to work wonders for me. With Detox or Die getting a UK national broadcast okay. and then going global via other TV networks and the internet, I was fast amassing many testimonials from struggling addicts who'd been influenced by the film to do their own Ibogaine treatment. Dear David, just wanted to say thank you. Detox or Die was incredible and has really pushed me towards sorting out my own opiate addiction. David, I want you to know that I'm going for Iboga treatment and I saw your movie Detox or Die as the only real proof that it can work. In my city, your video is famous and really, really being used in good ways to scare off youngsters from trying heroin. Thank you for making this film. This is an issue that needs more press and more discussion. Your film was the start of the journey that led me to I began. I watched heroin. I had unwittingly become a spokesperson for the stuff whether I liked it or not. Having never used drugs at all. I even had a former user from Wales who had successfully done an I began detox after watching my film come all the way up to Scotland to pay homage to me with a street performance loosely based on Bwiti rituals. What would you call that? What would you call that? What is, are we uh, saying that this is a Bwiti style or inspired mm. by the Bwiti people, the Bwiti religion rather? Uh, is that right? Four stone cleansing. Yeah. Four stone cleanse ritual, whatever. 
Four know, storm uh, plans. Four storm plans. <laughs> I just made it up. What the fuck are you on about? <laughs> I don't know. Fucking hell. It was ten years since I'd quit my methadone habit. I've used small doses of iboga on the rare occasions when I thought I might relapse, and it definitely helped stabilise me. Were there other alternatives to finding stability, though? I'd heard of some users who were provided with clean, legally prescribed heroin and morphine. Elliot works with an organisation supporting the human rights of drug users around the globe. He's also on prescribed morphine. What we are talking about... Yeah, the ice inside. I, I, I like boxes, I like tables inside. Oh, uh, that is a uh, some sort of. This is a syringe of morphine sulfate. Of morphine sulfate, which will kill you immediately. No, I inject it three times a day, oh, and do I'm really? not dead. Oh, well, I, 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 I presume wrong. You do. Really? I mean, London has 33 boroughs. Yeah. Only about three of them prescribe diamorphine. Yeah, right, so... And at the moment, I've been hearing that some people are trying to be forced off the diamorphine scripts. Even though there's just been a trial which has been extremely successful, uh, yeah. replicated results they found across Europe, that prescribing pure diamorphine to regular heroin users is extremely successful. They make massive benefits in gains in their health, in reductions in their criminal activity uh, is generally beneficial to them and to society at large. Most active drug users cannot come out if they're working, if they have responsible jobs. Yeah. They cannot come out publicly as a drug user because they will lose their jobs. It's as simple yeah. as that. Yeah. You know, when I was a university lecturer, I could not have come out as a regular heroin user. I would have lost my job straight away. I mean, all the research that's been done shows that there are enormous, very substantial numbers of people who are regular heroin users who live an otherwise normal life. They maintain jobs, they have family life, they live their lives, they pay taxes, they're ordinary citizens, apart from the fact that they use heroin. Yeah. I'm going to go and uh, take my shots in the toilet. Perhaps legal heroin was a viable option, but for obvious reasons was a bit of a political hot potato. With few doctors or clinics willing to prescribe such a controversial medication, addicts' options were limited. Perhaps iboga is the answer. There were some doctors who actually did ibogaine treatments. I'm talking to you from Miami Beach, Florida, where I have a very active medical practice. I'm a medical physician licensed in the United States. And I've done approximately 1,900 treatments myself, personally supervised treatments myself all over the world. So what is Ibogaine? Ibogaine is an addiction interrupter. It's a facilitator. It offers a window of opportunity for quick and easy opiate withdrawal. Ibogaine can accomplish in 24 hours what it might take me 90 days to do. The morning after Ibogaine, they will feel as well as they would feel 90 days into a cold turkey withdrawal. Now that's nothing short of a miracle, David. This is the most important discovery in the history of addiction medicine as far as opiate dependence in the history of the planet, without a doubt. Ibogaine, I believe, at some point in time, will be the mainstay of the treatment for opiate dependence. It's going to happen. It has to happen because it works that well. Dr. Camlet was very convincing, but is Ibogaine truly a magic bullet for drug addiction or just a strong placebo? I owed it to myself and the many desperate addicts contacting me to find out more about the drug and its true potential. I wanted to meet the best known Ibogaine provider in the world. Sarah Glatt in Holland had treated close to a thousand people. Her home had even become known as the Iboga House. If anyone knew how truly effective Ibogaine was, then it would be Sarah. When I arrived at Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam, 
there were already some new clients with her who were looking for treatment. Right. A girl from Australia had a long established addiction to morphine for a back injury, and two heroin users from Glasgow. It's nice to meet you too. Lovely to meet you. I've bought a lot of meth, but I wouldn't take a script. My doctor's trying to encourage me to take yeah. a script before I can over here, yes. rather than waste my money and throwing it away on Iboga. And I'm going to be doing some magic and it's going to be good. <laughs> <laughs> About an hour's drive from Amsterdam, we eventually arrived at Sarah's house, where she lived with her two daughters and son. Anything else you like? How many years have you been doing this? Eleven. How many? Do you get any rough idea how many you've treated? I think uh, 900 people. 900? Mm -hmm. Especially the last five years, it was really busy. I've treated lots of people, average of two each week, but sometimes even four or five. What got you into this, doing these treatments? What, what started you? Well, the knowledge. I got to know in my own trip that I got yeah. the knowledge to to do it. That I you did. Do it. You did I begin. Yeah. And in my trip, I got a, a vision that I should give it to other people because right. they could benefit a lot of it. How are you feeling? <laughs> Pretty nervous. I had a, an accident uh, almost 14 years ago, I fell off a five story building uh -huh. and fractured everything in my body. Um, suffer from degenerative chronic pain and my bones are kind of, yeah, breaking away I guess, falling apart. I was never actually even told they were giving me opiates. I didn't know I had a habit for two and a half years. Really? Yeah, and then I discovered it and it kind of, everything made sense why I couldn't remember, why I had cigarette burns in my clothes, why I was just nodding off all the time. Oh, right. Yeah, but it was a bit late by then. A legal junkie. Yeah, pretty much. This is my poison. 24-hour release morphine and Valium. <clears throat> That's one week's worth minus two doses. Um, I've weaned down from 500 to 100. It's mm -hmm. taken me seven years. <laughs> Within an hour of arrival, the treatment sessions start. Ian takes the test dose of Iboga. Two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. Ago. And you already see that he's changing his reaction. <laughs> <laughs> you can feel something already, yeah? Cramps are going away. And this is just the test dose? Mm -hmm. Yes. Have you seen this working as fast before? Yeah, many times. <laughs> you're here now, you've done it. There's no going back. It's, you've made that choice, mate. You only need to take a little bit and you still can you can still eat and drink and sleep and do everything you want to do. Yeah. You just don't have cravings to use and you don't have the withdrawals. Easy. Here we go. Thank you. You're welcome. Blessing is what I'm about to receive. Hi, David. Hi. Nice to meet you. Sorry, yeah, nice Carla was a Dutch heroin addict who had had a successful media career, but her habit had become too much Did for her. scare you in any way at all? Well, you know, I'm in a you? position where I'm just so tired of everything that I just don't know what to do anymore, you know? It's yeah. like life or death, and there's no middle way anymore. I don't know, I was a little bit scared when I was coming here in the train. Came just, what about if I don't survive it? What about if I die in between in the treatment? You won't die. No, people were... I wrote to some place in another country and then they said, no, you cannot do it, you're too skinny, you're underweight, you're too this, you're too that, you're going to die. They said about my crumbs, is it? Yeah. 
when I, when I took the cats over, I was getting cramps. I was starting to sweat, starting to shake. Yeah. Feeling cold, cramp, the usual. I just took my cramps away in two minutes. Two minutes? Two minutes. I felt myself stomping to scratch, stomping to squeeze And my you legs. don't think it was like a placebo thing, you know? Well, I tried to justify it to myself. I was like, is this human willpower over? Over something, or is there something happening? Yeah. Well, I've been lying space for the last two hours. Just pure space out. In a good get way. Up, get in a good way. Yeah. yeah. It's saying goodbye to a good, good old friend. <sighs> Seems a little odd, right? <laughs> Hello, baby. Come and self become self-aware of yourself again. Yes, yes. You see the person you used to be, and you're like, oh, right, that's what I'm trying to hold on to. <laughs> hold on now. Your mind's recognising the fact that it's working. Yeah. Rather than being in a constant stupor, everything. Yes. For 23 hours a day, chasing the dragon. Because you don't concentrate on anything apart from getting your gear. Yes. Kids going to school and getting fed, and that's dead easy. It's getting the gear, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> How is it going? Is it giving chills? I'm not really feeling this drooling in my body. Oh. Not feeling withdrawals anymore. Oh. Fine. It's amazing. It's quite normal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Five capsules to okay. start. Good luck with this, Carla. Thank and you. Good luck. Yeah? Let me know the best. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I'm in good hands. Ian, six hours into treatment. Mm. Are you tripping? Mm, probably. <laughs> Will you be able to spot another two right now? Yeah. Okay. You want two capsules? Yeah. That's it. See you later. See you later. See you later, Carla. So you think uh, this one will be pretty straightforward? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We think it will be really good. You've, you're quite happy with how they're doing. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah, nobody's okay. complaining. <laughs> and you must have seen so many things, so many reactions over those years. Mm -hmm. And this is nothing. No, it's nothing. For these guys. No, no, not nothing. It's not nothing, but it's easy. Yeah, it's easy. It's easier than any other way. Yes. Otherwise, they'd be sick. They're not sick. Why is it you feel a need to work with drug addicts? I knew drug addicts from the squat. From squatting, you know, I knew drug addicts. And uh, they were miserable people. It was a uh, horrible, horrible life. They're always shaking, and always need some money for the drugs. I'm trying to make it as easy as possible for them. Yeah. Yeah, that's my duty here, to make it as easy as possible. Day two, 20 hours after starting treatment. I gave him more than oh, his friend. Done. He got um, six capsules, totally. He's totally delirious. Yeah, he's totally good. It's enough, you know? Yeah. No need to do or overdo it. Do you think he's quite enjoying that? Yeah, he was smiling every now and then. Yeah. Yeah, so it's okay. He's enjoying it. So despite the fact it looks a bit weird, it doesn't necessarily mean he's not enjoying it. No. Oh. Okay. He could be seeing his children walking around or somebody he knows. 
I'm going to give Eleanor another capsule because she was complaining, having a little bit of backache. Yeah. <laughs> All the torture. Oh, yeah. So is that withdrawal or is that a... The is the, Yeah. Detoxifying him. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say, gee whiz, that looks just as bad as heroin withdrawal. Mm -hmm. But if that was, if they were going through... Heroin withdrawals, it was all the time. It would be, it'd be a lot worse. A lot worse. I keep it simple. And everyone is different, so everyone get what they need. You see, you see people coming here withdrawing for years. Yeah. So why would we do for fun, <laughs> have a sniff of cocaine mm. or ecstasy? It's yeah. Not interesting. So you've never had an interest in doing drugs at all. No. No, not really. And for the same for my sister and my brother. I think my younger sister and brother also would never be interested. And it doesn't bother you seeing like really hardened junkies come in here no. for treatment. It doesn't bother you at all. No, we're used to it. So it doesn't doesn't matter and Yeah. Most of the time they're friendly people, so and it's nice to see but they come really looking bad and feeling bad and then end of the week they have a smile on their face it's really nice you yeah. see it yeah yeah that, or they get some color in their skin it's really a big difference before and after so it's nice what i saw you in the kitchen yeah i just came to get some chewing gum to the chewing gum so you're not even lying in bed no and you were only here two two days ago no yesterday 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 we started you know exactly what a uh, withdrawal will be like. I mean, you've gone through withdrawal before. Yeah, many times. Yeah, I wouldn't be sitting here so calmly on a bed now, I think. <laughs> no. no. I would be yelling here and then, or I'd be already on the street looking for something, I think. I wouldn't be sitting the next day like this. This, sh this should be the worst day, the second day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Second, look third at you. day. There's no tremor in your legs. No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Isn't that lovely? Yeah, it is. <laughs> this is what I'm doing it for. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> Just so far away, they don't notice. You know, it can happen. Not yeah. always, but it can happen. You should consider them like uh, young babies. <laughs> they are not in control at this point. You know, when I took the Ibogaine, I don't remember being out of it like that. No, but no. everyone reacts different. I had a girl who, who was out of it for five days. Really? Yeah, and we had to feed her and to give her to drink and she couldn't remember anything. Ian, 40 hours after taking Iboga. Um, he's not having a seizure. No? No, he's just panicking. Mm. Mm. Breathe. David, mm. turn it off, please. Will you turn it off, please? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I need to give you more oxygen just to make it. Sure. I saw people fainting before, but like that. I'm sorry. Eleanor, 40 hours after starting treatment. Ah, I understand, I understand that language. She sometimes will on tea. <laughs> oh. Oh. Okay, let me get this sorted out for you. Can you, you, know, you, can you talk? Is he still tripping? Ah. Ian? Ian? Hello? Yeah, but do you think it's going to help you in the end? Quit? I hope so. I hope. 
I think it's there, I can say this. It's all back on it. It worked. I didn't expect to feel so worn out afterwards, but what do you expect? You know, all the toxins coming out of your body and... Do you really feel like it's a new life? Yep. Yeah? Well, if you think about it, I'm 32 mm -hmm. and I had my accident when I was 18. So I've never been an adult without opiates until now. You've been out of it for three days. Yeah. Totally tripping for three days. Do you remember any of it? No, I can't remember any of it. Nothing? No. How are you feeling over there, Paul? Paul? Two of the treatments had gone really well. Eleanor got rid of the rest of her medication. Carla went away with a smile on her face. She had sailed through a seemingly painless withdrawal from heroin. Iboga seemed to have worked amazingly well. But Paul and Ian were still struggling with their detox, so Sarah gave them more capsules. Okay, keep it in. You're not going to go back to it. No. If, you're, if you're going to use, you'll die. Your body is not so strong. Yeah. No. Uh, you'll die if you do it because you're clean I took a break from the Iboga house to reassess my feelings my own treatment was pretty heavy going at first but relatively easy compared to what I just witnessed when I returned I see an ambulance parked outside Ian stopped breathing and the paramedics have been called this is the hospital yeah. he's waking up Ian Okay. Bye, buddy. Bye. I had to travel back to the UK. I honestly thought that was the last I'd see of Good Ian then. alive. Ian? Oh, dear. On one level, Iboga had seemed to work very effectively, but on another, it seemed to be potentially lethal. How could I be a spokesman for such a dangerous treatment? Uh, if I ended the film here, it just... Well, I don't think it would look too good <clears throat> for Iboga treatment. So I'm going to continue. I'll continue. I wanted to speak to some other people who had used Iboga or Ibogaine to quit an addiction. The doctor's going to come and get you. So please give it up for Sebastian Hosley. <laughs> Sebastian Horsley was a decadent London writer, artist and outrageous dandy. Good evening. He'd seen my film back in 2004 my and had done an Ibogaine treatment Sebastian. to help get off a crack I and heroin habit. Useless. Dandy. It certainly seemed to have helped him for a short while at least. Bankrupt. I'll either commit suicide or be dead at 45 because I'll have said all there is to say. He'd agreed to do an interview with me about his Ibogaine experience. I met up with him at a party in London the night before the interview. He seemed very agitated. This out of focus photograph I took is probably the last one of him alive. He was found dead the next day. A lethal cocktail of heroin, crack, painkillers and downers, mixed down with some fine red wine. Instead of conducting an interview, I was soon attending a funeral. It seemed another nail in the coffin for the long-term efficacy of Ibogaine. Mickey was another offbeat character I found in the Notting Hill area of London. He'd taken Iboga and had managed to stay seven years clean. Even though he'd ended up back on a heroin substitute prescription, it did seem that Iboga had helped him in the past. 
Seven years was a fair amount of time to be free of addiction. Like weird fucking shrines and, you know, just kind of things put together. Like you can see the teeth out the jaw. That was off one of the murdered victims in the cave. That's my pet cat. That was your cat? Poor thing died. And you had it stuffed? I, I, I cleaned it. I cleaned it and cured it. Yeah. So she's still here. Ow! <laughs> so you've had some huge habits. I mean, I've, yeah, you know, I've, I've, I've had, I've had, I've had, I've had huge habits. I've also had some very minuscule, pathetic habits. Yeah. You know, I suppose, I suppose we all have. Some pretty weird stuff you got around here, Mickey. Yeah. I I was on um, methadone amps, 50 mil methadone amps. Injectable I, methadone. Injectable methadone, yeah. right? 50 mil amps. I was on six of those a day, and I was on another hundred mil of fisetone pills, um, and 20 dex, 20 dexedrine speed a day. Yeah. Plus Rohypnol, I was on about half a dozen a day. I managed to get a chunk of Ibogaine. Um, it was before they actually had the hydrochloride. It was a basic, it was a basic bark uh, root Ibogaine. Um, didn't know what I was taking, how much. Chucked a lump down my throat. Um, I swallowed it about a mile and a half from away from here on a hot summer's day. By the time I got to support Bella, which is about half a mile up the road, it came on fucking strong. On the third day, I came out of it. There were no withdrawals. Um, I just felt very tired. Um, I was able to start sleeping straight away. Um, and I felt good. I had no... There was that it, it felt like there was no rhyme or reason to take junk, and that that for me was amazing. I think certain psychedelics and psychotropic drugs, chemicals um, can help. Um, can help us change ourselves. It can open up a part of ourselves, which we've over the years we've lost. Perhaps there was something to what Mickey no, said. The weird, the weird is, Psychedelics, such as iboga, um, may have healing properties worthy of serious investigation. It's better than giving them a lot of longer term analgesics. Was there any interest in Ibogaine from the medical establishment? I went to a specialist conference where I spoke to Dr. Ben Sessa, who was currently doing research into psychedelic therapy. I think the, the field of addictions and uh, psychiatry and addictions and psychedelic drugs is very closely linked and a massive amount of work that went on in the 50s and 60s with LSD as an agent for um, treating addictions and it's an area that absolutely needs to be researched. We know that Ibogaine is useful because we can look at the epidemiological evidence and the cross-cultural evidence that in, the, in West Africa it's used for this reason and it's very successful. The trouble is that modern medicine and modern science, we need to have a evidence-based uh, data approach. So although it might have been used for thousands of years in other cultures, unfortunately that doesn't mean anything to modern West Western medicine until we carry out the studies. I, I think that the underground work that goes on is interesting, but I would be concerned about it because are there the right safeguards in place? Are the right quality control standards in place? How do we know that there's the right support systems? So I think the underground work is probably very beneficial and can be positive in some ways, but my real aim is to bring, this, bring these drugs into the mainstream. There's very little interest from mainstay science about Ibogaine, and why? Because all studies that are done in major universities are funded by big drug companies, and no big drug company wants to fund a drug that's going to take their patients off the drugs that they're making money from already. They make billions of dollars of selling pain pills. 
Why would we want to come up with a drug that people take once and cuts into our profits? That's it in a nutshell. This is pro Ibogaine, if Ibogaine could turn a profit for Big Pharma, it would be here next year legalized in the United States. I was still hoping to witness a truly miraculous treatment. I went to meet the man who was seriously considering an Iboga detox. I have never met this man before, but... Is that Bradley? Hi. Hey. Hi. There you go, mate. What have you taken today? Um, I've had two bags of brown and uh, two white, two rocks. Two rocks? Yeah. Um, like speedball, hit up, you know. You shoot them? You shoot them together? Yes, I shoot them together, yeah. yeah. You used all that? Yes. He got so wasted he did bizarre things like drinking paint and shoplifting items he had no use for. He knew he had to change. Well, what did it for me was um, there was this, uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, my generation of friends all started to be afflicted by this terrible drug, heroin. I, at the time, was on the uh, polar other uh, opposite end of that. Uh, I had a partnership in a gymnasium. Now, I was uh, taking drugs of a different nature, like anabolic and androgenic steroids. Uh, at the time, because it was all in the name of looking great and vanity and alt restaurant and being bronzed and cut and all the rest of it and bulk, uh, I didn't see uh, any problem with that. And, I certainly didn't realise I was a drug addict at that point. All my friends around me, my peers around me, were dropping like flies and becoming addicted to this stuff. And I was, I had such a cocky, uh, arrogant attitude. Um, I won, uh, I remember the first time, I snatched the foil off a guy and I said, let's see what all the fuss is about. And I'll, I'll tell you something now. And I really believed it at the time. That stuff will never do what it's done to you, to me. How do you feel now? Just relief. All those hard fucking angular corners are just rounded off. Uh, you know, life, sharpness of it, the angles, aggressive, mm -hmm. pointing, fucking... Uh, and this is just like taking away all those fucking aggressive angles, the way I perceive the world, uh, you know. So this is where I, I began came in that you saw that as mm. an attractive option. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that's now something you want to do. You yeah, really, yeah. really want to do this. Yes, yes. You know the, um, that there are risks with it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, I do know people have died from it, but, um, you know, I'll have a full uh, cardiogram, uh, get my bike out, start, you know, uh, eating uh, good and get myself geared up towards that uh, place. And I'm sure to God, my goodness, with the drugs I've put inside me and uh, the levels and amounts of drugs I've taken over the years, if, I mean, they never took me out. Uh, if I began took me out, then uh, maybe it was meant to be that way. I don't know, but... Uh, it seems to me that it's the last chance saloon. You know, when you're on your arse and you're saying, my life's in tatters, my career's fucked, uh, nobody believes a word I say, uh, uh, you know, I'm uh, seen as being like, you know, a junkie and uh, I feel worthless and... Uh, I'm so isolated from society and, uh, you know, when you hit that point, uh, well, for me anyway, when I hit that point, 
I, uh, I knew that there was work that needed to be done. Hmm. Bloody filters, I've got to get some filters for this thing. Hmm. Some... Morning. I normally send Richard out so as to evade uh, getting tangled up in this uh, world of junk, which is... Well, Bradley's mate Richard soon appeared with even more yeah, gear. Like, uh, you alright, Richard? Ten pounds worth of heroin, ten pounds worth of crack cocaine. Ten pounds worth of heroin? And ten pounds worth of crack in there? Yeah. And how long will that keep you together? The actual initial high of it may be only 30, 40 seconds, but mm -hmm. then it has that lingering effect because the crack wears off quite quick and then leaves you with the brown, um, the heroin effect. Mm -hmm. Do you shoot in the groin? Yeah, I do. All right. If you because want to just keep they're that. gone. <laughs> you know. Right, if you want to go and do that in the toilet. Okay. There seemed to be a continual movement in and out the flat yeah, to find money through pawning goods yeah. or waiting for benefit checks, all to score more brown and white. Right, we're going to walk down into uh, King's Cross here, uh, just to the, uh, to the cash machine. Hi uh, Leon, it's Richard. Can you do me two and two? So you got your stuff? Yes. Can you show me what it looks like? So ten pound worth of heroin. Is the heroin what is it? Do they colour coordinate them? Yeah. So what the heroin's always in a blue one? Uh or generally? Generally, yeah. Abstinence is my goal, you know. I wish I, wish I could uh, get abstinent again. And it's easy when you're all loaded and you're all brave. <laughs> but when you're not, and the wolves are fucking knocking, uh, mm -hmm. then you got problems, you know. It's very frightening. I, I run my whole life and existence runs on fear, you know. There we are. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a sad old existence. Um, but there we have it, you know. Um, you get up the next day and it's like this. You, you're, you're on loop. Uh, fucking Groundhog Day. It certainly was like Groundhog Day. Six hours later, they were doing it all over again. Start in the day. <laughs> This is, what time is this? 10 past 5 a.m. Why, why is this happening so early? What happened? Well, we have a dealer that comes on at this time. A what? Uh, <coughs> a dealer comes on at this time. A dealer comes on? Yeah, it just starts at 5 a.m. because okay. there's no one else around. And are you going to go back to sleep? Yeah. <laughs> there was another entire story to Richard, though. I was surprised to learn he'd worked at Buckingham Palace as one of the Queen's footmen. My mum's got great pictures of me, like, riding on the back of um, the Irish state coach to the state opening of Parliament and um, riding down the course at uh, Royal Ascot and things like that. Mm. And then you compare that to what I'm doing right now. Footman for the Queen? Mm. Is that, what do you call it? What's That's it? what I was. I was the Queen's footman. The Queen's footman? Yeah. Is there only one? There's two. But only one ever works at any one time. And basically you look after her dogs, you, re you record her races. Uh, you record her races? Yeah, he's, you lay up the table for breakfast. Tea. Corgis, you're looking after the corgis. They're not all oh. corgis, half of them are doggies. She calls them doggies. Because oh really, that's Prin good. <coughs> Princess Margaret's dash home got in with the corgis a few years ago. So it was Princess Diana that actually gave me the idea to join the royal household in the first place. I was too much into uh, Manchester. What do you mean? You when, I, when I was at school, 
Yes. I did a work experience at Amos House in Acton, and Diana was patron of Turning Point, the charity. All right. And she visited while I was doing oh, my yeah. two week work experience. Turning I asked point. for her autograph. Really? <laughs> she told me, give my address to her lady in waiting. And I got a letter through the post saying the princess would very much like to meet me again. So I went to Kensington Palace and I was with her for about 20 minutes in her sitting room at Kensington Palace. All right. And she said, when you get to be 18, you might be interested in the job of footman in the royal household. And I did that for a year and then got promoted to Queen's Footman. It's an incredible life. Yeah. After three years, I got my certificate as a footman, which is what you get after three years. You get a certificate to certify that I've done the job and everything. And so I decided to go somewhere else where I wouldn't be repeating every single year. Every single year I wouldn't be doing the same round of Balmoral, Sandring, Bastard. Windsor, blah, 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 round and round and round. Bastard. Does it not feel quite weird then? I'm not, I'll, I know you don't want me to film you doing this. Uh, but... Go on, ask. <laughs> does it not feel weird to have had that life amongst such affluence and now be living in a hostel, oh shooting up God. crack and heroin, and taking well, methadone. I can't in. tell you how it feels like such a fall. Honestly, my address used to be Footman's Floor, Buckingham Palace. It's now St Mungo's, <laughs> King's Cross. <laughs> you know. Uh, could you have not knocked it in the head at an early stage? Maybe like, I could have done it in the last three years. Yes. But only now am I truly even thinking about it. Yeah. Do you think hitting 30 is yeah. going to be like a milestone? Or I think you might yeah. just say, like, I need to knock this in the head. I think, yeah, I'd probably do some thinking. <laughs> Are you I'm married? Is that a marriage ring? No. That's the ring. That? It's a ring someone gave me earlier on for lending them some money. <laughs> yeah. She's in the hostel. They know, they know each other's paydays, of course. And... Uh, they know it's his payday, so they wouldn't have bloody left him alone. So I got a hassle. Yeah. A gold ring? Yeah. <sighs> right, I'm going to get some fresh air. Okay, Richard. Later, yeah, right, yeah okay, see you later, Rich. man. Right, right. Thanks for coming. Take care, Richard. Right. So you had your early morning hits? Yeah. Of a few pipes. Yeah. Um, Little bit of wine, uh, Brett Brown. But you get much else done in the day. I mean, it seems to be a lot of shooting up and mm. smoking pipes and shit. Yeah, I but mean, do you do anything else? Do you actually manage to get anything done? Is it all um, your whole day? Of late, not really. No. So your whole day is taken up with this. Yeah, uh, either, either this or just sitting around waiting for it. Well, just not doing anything, not not functioning as a human being. Yeah. There is hope, and I do hope. Well, I will get out of this and live my life as it should, as as I should be living it. I'm perfectly aware that I'm harming myself and my mental health's not that great at the moment. I feel a shell, uh, a ghost. Um, but, you know, there is a way and uh, I aim to get out of it. I decided to show Bradley some of the footage I'd shot in Holland. He had to know what he was linking himself in for.
What do you think? Very interesting. Uh, without a doubt, I believe in the uh, substance. Um, That's not put you off? No. No, that hasn't put me off. If I can come out of that feeling, hey, this is not so bad. I have a good starting a foundation block to, yeah. in which to build on. I really felt Iboga could help Bradley. He certainly needed something to break his destructive addiction. We decided to meet up again soon when he was ready to do his treatment. I got a phone call from Sarah to say that Ian had survived and had made it back to Glasgow. I couldn't believe he was alive and had to get over to see how he was. The treatment had failed though and Ian and Paul were back using again. See when I saw you, mm -hmm. I actually thought you weren't going to pull through. I thought you were a dead well, man. You looked like a guy that had actually was on his last legs. Well, see when I had to go for this exercise bike to try and pass this test to get out of the hospital. Yeah. That's what the nurse, that's the only nurse that told me. She was like, ah, you're a very lucky lad, Mr Wilson. She was like, we didn't think you were going to make it. I didn't realise I was that bad. Yes. I didn't realise I was that close to death. Yes, yes, yes. You know what I mean? Shh. Frightening. It seemed that Ian had an underlying heart condition that had almost oh, proved fatal yeah. when Iboga was ingested. What have you been doing? This is one of the issues with Iboga and Ibogaine. They can seriously slow the heart rate, leading to cardiac arrhythmia and the possibility of total heart failure. The shock of his near-fatal reaction had disturbed his friend Paul so much that he went back on heroin too. <clears throat> I'd heard about an Irish massage therapist who died after taking Iboga in Gabon quite recently and a London doctor had been struck off for administering the drug to a sex addict. Some sordid stories were coming out, but much worse was to come. I got a call from Sarah's daughter Daphne, tell me she'd thought her mother had been arrested over a client's death. I immediately got on a plane to Holland to find out what happened. This place here, this highway, the guy, the guy was uh, at the hotel. Yeah. And in the night at four o'clock, he uh, he walked up the road, high road here. Yes. And he was run over. Just here, this road here. A client left after the second day of treatment, walked onto the motorway, and was killed by a truck. The police blamed Sarah for irresponsible treatment of the man, and letting him leave while under the influence of iboga. So you uh, were a bit concerned about Sarah maybe being arrested by the police. We don't know what we're going to go back to at no. the house. No, Sarah doesn't uh, answer her phone. And uh, I got an uh, emergency text message from the lawyer to go to Sarah's house and uh, wait until my brother comes home. Okay. Sarah left a note yeah. that she went to the police and we have to call the lawyer. I was desperate to find out if Sarah was in jail and if so, when she would be released. Okay. I tried ringing her lawyer. Okay, well, we'll he tells me she'll be released soon. Yeah. But with a manslaughter charge hanging over her, I wasn't so sure. Yeah. It turns out we didn't have to wait too long. She was released from prison the next day. I can't believe it. You walked how many, how many, how far away is that place? Well, I don't know, two and a half, three kilometres. I am not allowed from them to do anything anymore. Any treatments? No treatments, no iboga in my hands, no people in my house, nothing. Really? Yeah. That's why I'm here. Otherwise, I would not be here. That's it finished here then? That's unfinished, yeah. Here. 
Right. So that's what we need to do at okay. the moment. We need to, uh, to get witnesses. Yeah. As many as possible. Okay. Fifty will do, or okay. eighty. Anyway, a representative uh, category of yeah. people that have been treated by you yeah. mm -hmm. and that can testify in court mm -hmm. about uh, you as a person. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, about the treatment with uh, mm -hmm. Iboga. And I'm very positive and confident that we will, in the end, uh, win this case. You know who he was talking to? To the television news. What about the money situation? Yeah, I have to organize that. That's a lot of money. Yeah, it's a lot of money. But I'm sure I'll get the Did help. Did you say 20,000 euros? 23,000 euros. Shit. But this so way. I have to get people to help me right now. Yeah. So let's go. I'm glad that there are very positive people as well who want to help me. Yeah. yeah that I, I always help everybody, but now maybe it's the time that someone will help me. Sarah had been interviewed by journalists and now her photo was splashed all over the press. She was unhappy about the way the media had called her a witch That's doctor. my picture from yesterday. And even felt some of the articles were anti-Semitic towards her. That's you and Calamero. Yeah. I have to give my passport to the police because they don't want me to run away. Okay. Think I can come in? Yeah. Why not? And how film would I do? I thought you were joking there. No, you saw them from the car window? Yeah, I saw them. I could see she was getting increasingly paranoid about journalists coming near her property. But maybe she had cause to be. Het Openbaar Ministerie neemt het Sara G. het meest kwalijk. Die nacht loopt hij in verwarde toestand hier de snelweg op. Wordt geschept door een vrachtwagen en overlijdt. Ik had mensen zouden genezen. Die heeft mensen willen helpen. Met de voorwaarde dat ze haar Iboga behandelingen oh, stopzet. Yeah, two weeks ago the police came to my house with a search warrant. And they thought I, I'm, I'm hiding dead bodies in my garden. People who died it. Died here under the Iboga treatment, yeah. and instead of uh, calling the uh, ambulance or some or, or some services to help me with the dead bodies, I buried them all over the place. So all of my garden is full of dead bodies. You know, those people have great imagination. So as if some junkie had come here for treatment and it had gone wrong. That's he right. died. He died, and I buried him in my garden. Yeah, yeah. I'm kind of mental. Psychopath. Yeah. Yeah, that's what they're trying to make. That's why they call me witch, you know. The people that have died, what would you say about the people that have died whilst around the time of taking Ibogaine or Iboga? Well, they had a health issue they didn't know about. One had a brain tumor. It's the last chance, you know, they're standing at the cliff and mm. someone is telling them, I'll pay you money, just try this thing. Mm. Maybe it will save you. I don't want anybody to die. I help them so they don't die. And now they tell me, oh, uh, you want to kill people on purpose. But they the, lost their mind. I met a guy who wanted to speak up for Sarah. Ronald had been helped by her with an Iboga treatment a couple of years before. I never saw him without his dark glasses on. Absolutely. Elsa would be dead right now. You're planning to kill yourself? Yeah. Yeah? yeah I was in the last stages of planning and I, I just wanted one more thing. I wanted to go to Sarah's place. She, she gave me the test dose. Yeah. But the test dose turned out to be uh, much more than I ever... Would imagine. Yeah. So the testos was the full, the full on thing for me. Yeah. So I had, I had what I, uh, what I, what I wanted. I had what I wished for, and uh, and it was hard, but yeah. it was worth it. And was this was this is uh, 
a spirit ancestor? What did you see it as that was talking to you? Oh yeah, I will, I will go so far that it's, that it's God, God himself. Yeah? Yeah. There is always a fight be because, be between good and evil and that will always be there and you have to take sides, you know, you can fight, you can just say, okay, let the pharmaceutical earn their own big money and let the people uh, take methadone for the rest of their lives and antidepressants for the rest of their lives. And I know how to help them, but I'm not going to do it because other people think. I don't give a fuck what other people think. They're just people. They're like dust in the wind, you know? What do you think, Ronald? Well, I think she's a celebrity now. <laughs> celebrity? Yeah. <laughs> the Boga celebrity. First, uh, she was the Boga mama. Now, she is the Boga celebrity. <laughs> <laughs> Two weeks later, Ronald completely flipped out. The media reports got him believing that Sarah was a witch. He turned up at her house, broke windows, and threatened her with a kitchen knife. 28 a.m. Hi, David, it's Bradley. Fucking hell, what an injustice I'm doing to, to myself. After I got back from Holland, there were a load of phone messages from Bradley. Carrying on like that will go one way. I'll lose my home, I'll lose my family, and it could be a very, a, another very sad fucking tale. Uh... It seems like he's opted for a more traditional form of detox and a residential rehab. Yeah, I've got my head screwed back on again. I want to live, I want to be creative, and it's just crushed me uh, in, in, in every sense. Despite the fact he had opted not to do an iboga treatment, Bradley wanted to meet up and tell me about his experiences of living drug-free. Oh, wow. Look at that. What's that? You. Oh, yeah, yeah. My oh, God, it's good to see you. Howdy, friend, howdy. <laughs> I felt a bit guilty that I'd inadvertently put him off taking Iboga with the lurid footage I'd shown him. The guy's holding the camera. I would never have thought beyond my wildest dreams that I could uh, be here now. Uh, I thought I was going to die there. Uh, I thought it was a possibility as well. Yeah, Richard's like, dead. Richard's dead. What? Yeah, he died. Richard's yeah. dead? Yeah, yeah, Richard died. I found out. Oh, for yeah, he died. He went to hospital with two collapsed lungs and pneumonia. Oh, uh, and then he got oh, organ God. failure and he died. Yeah. Did you just find that out recently? Yeah, just recently, yeah. 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 Real, oh, real shame, because he was a lovely guy. And... I really liked him. Yeah. He was just, uh, I mean, he was nice. Um, he had a nice nature. Absolutely. Even though his drug consumption was chaotic, yeah. he didn't lose the plot too much. You yeah, know I mean, he, he was still, you could feel his pleasant personality. Absolutely, his authentic self still managed yeah. to uh, get through all that chemical haze. Yeah. Everything I said I would never do, always ended up, I ended up doing them. Mm. I would never inject in my groin, I did. I would never inject in the neck, I did. Uh, I would never do some of the things I've done, uh, but I did. I felt I had no choice. Uh, I was snatching handbags uh, mm. in the latter parts of my using, which yeah. I'm deeply ashamed about, but it happened, and if I could ever find them people to make amends with them, I would. In my insanity, I would often say, this, this won't happen to me. Mm. Uh, I was the type of thinking that, think, thought, I could kill myself and still go on. <laughs> That's the insanity, you know. Uh, yeah, I could die today, but uh, somehow on another level, I think I can still go on. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the uh, Iboga, Ibogaine. Bradley had a little surprise for me. He'd actually been using microdoses of Iboga and Ibogaine uh, to help find stability in his life. You're using this stuff therapeutically Absolutely. as part of your um, recovery program? Absolutely. To bolster it and put some wheels on it. How are you finding it? I'm finding it very helpful. Very helpful. Really? Uh, for example, the other night I had a microdose. Uh, I was sitting, uh, laying down on, re on reflection, uh, listening to some uh, 
calming, positive affirmation based uh, meditation. And I, I, just for a bit of exposure therapy, I, I decided, look, uh, how would a, I visualized a, uh, some tinfoil and some heroin and some crack, uh, just waiting to go. And my initial thoughts was, that would be a really, really, really bad idea. And if that's not the, the desire removed, I don't know what is. I am no longer waking up on a morning, wanting to die, racked with fear, uh, thinking, where the hell am I going to get my next fix from? I need it. Um, and then consequently, sometime that day, end up stabbing myself in purgatory, yeah. telling myself I'm okay. Well, let's see. Well, that's good you're painting again. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right, I was glad he'd sorted his life out, but it meant I had to find someone else who was intending to do a full iboga treatment. Then I met up with a guy called Sid Skid, a performance artist, a musician with a very damaging drug addiction. He'd come across me through watching my documentary online and he'd told me of his intention to do a full flood dose of Ibogaine and Iboga. There's more self done tattoos. All right, let's have a look at that. Let me see. You did those yourself? Mm-hmm. Oh, were they Hindu symbols or something? Yeah. I'm not a Nazi. I know you're not a Nazi, it's the a Hindu symbol. The amount of people that say, oh, you're a Nazi. They, they, these are the most, uh, <laughs> ones I get the most stick for. <laughs> oh, right. Walking down the street with. <laughs> like, what on earth is that? The Jewish swastika. <laughs> and it's um, the peace symbol. Yeah. It's not, um, as yeah, we Yeah, it know. would be a bit bizarre to be a Jewish Nazi. Yeah. Um, but then again, and the world... And you're gay. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not a Nazi. No, I know you're not a Nazi. They're, they're, they're nice in their uniforms, though, the German soldiers. Yeah. I'm um, prescribed 600 milligrams of um, MST a day. So what's MST? Uh, it's morphine slow release. It's kind of um, prescribed to you know, people with cancer, terminal illnesses. You cook it, and as it cools, the, the wax literally floats to the surface, and you can sort of skim it off. All right. Um, you know, obviously wax getting into your into your, <laughs> your veins and your capillaries is really dangerous, but um, it's also, they also bind it with talc. This stuff's killing you, really. It could kill yeah. you. Yeah. Oh, well, totally. Like, you think it... Totally. I mean, you're a young guy now. You're in your early 30s. But within 10 years, that th stuff's bound to damage th you. I think if I did it for 10 years, I would be dead. The slow-release morphine. To get around the the slow release, you have to um, break down the wax matrix, basically. So just scrape the coating off. A tiny bit of salt. Grind it down to as fine as I can. Five mils water. Turn the hub on. It's just to blow boiling, basically. What happens if it boils? Does it destroy it? It destroys the morphine, yes. Um, it's now boiling this mixture up. Yeah, like, that, that goes in. You can already see the wax sticking to the outside. And then uh, into the freezer. This has always been the way that i found the most effective. Riveting TV. <laughs> That's cold. So back to the hob. Cool. I started doing it because they were underdosing me at the SAU. Um, I, wasn't, I wasn't on a dose high enough to stop me from being in withdrawal every day and researched ways to, you know, make the morphine stronger or make it last longer. And this was pretty much what came out of the Google results. Most, most of the advice is not to do it, but yeah. it's the safest way to do it if you are going to do it. And right, so should we go and do this? Yeah. Cool. 
Sid was after the morphine high he got from the concoction he was injecting okay. every day. The downside was that the habit so, was slowly killing him. So I've been going in my groin for two years. Wax from the tablet still got into his bloodstream and ended up collecting that? in his lungs and other <laughs> organs. It still makes you feel good. Yeah. <laughs> Of course it does. <laughs> I don't think it ever won't. Like, there was loads of stuff going on when I was a kid, I, and I was a really sensitive kid. I'm, like, I'm really, really sensitive, and like, I'm, I internalise everything, and I take it out on myself, and yeah. I've you know, I, I seen the, the, state, the state of my arms from cutting, cutting my arms over the years. And, I mean, oh, this is, yeah, uh, I mean, I mean this, this is nothing compared with some cuts I've seen on some people. What have you, and I, I'll leave in these. Oh my God, right, yeah. No, that's what I used to do when I was a teenager before I got into... There's it. quite serious cuts then at the... Piercing. Of those years. Hmm. Piercing and tattooing was my way out, really, in my productive sort of alternative to doing that. I know. This shit's going to kill you, you know it. Hmm. It, it, it is killing you. Mm. Your, your lungs are, are getting destroyed by that stuff. Mm -hmm. And what, I mean, uh, presumably it goes to your liver and kidneys or God knows where else. I mean, if this flat wax and chalk is floating around your body, God knows where it ends up. <laughs> okay. I was a heroin addict from 17. Um, I had some, um, I, I was sexually abused when I was 11. And yes, and how, how that, you just, you told me earlier about that, and that, that really, do you think that was the... That was major definitely the catalyst, thing, the yeah. major event in your life that changed yeah. you forever. Yeah, because because I was only 11 and I hadn't had any, um, I, w I wasn't even pubescent, so I didn't have any, I had no, no contact with sex, didn't know what sex was, what love was, anything like that. Um, and my first contact was being raped by a man at 11, so uh, it took me a lot of years to work through all that. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm 32 now, and I think I've pretty much come to terms with it now, but it's taken that long. I don't think paedophiles realise quite how much they mess kids' lives up. And this guy got off with it as well. Yeah, it was my, my word against his, he got away with it. I got nothing, <laughs> apart from a fucked up life. I'm just <laughs> making the, dark, the room dark. You become really hypersensitive to light and noise. It was midday, and Sid took an initial test dose of iboga to see if he'd have an allergic reaction. Oops. Right. Are you starting to feel the effects of that stuff? Must be. <laughs> nothing, um, nothing, uh, visually or anything, but I'm a bit wobbly. Twelve o'clock was the I took my... Twelve o'clock test dose. This was going to be a self-treatment. So He'd done meticulous in research into Iboga and had worked out a timetable of when the capsules had to be taken. One cap for 200, two caps. That's, two six, caps. that's 600 milligram total. And, and I want to get to about 1,200 altogether. And um, should we be doing the blood pressure and heart rate around the same time then? Yeah, every half hour from now. Despite Sid's preparations, uh, I knew that I was going to be acting as his provider and carer. Yeah. I would be checking his pulse rate, um, so blood pressure, and giving the capsules at the right times. Two or three hours, so if we say three to four. This is now an hour and a half after your test dose, mm. and you're feeling no sense of withdrawal? No, nothing. What's this you've got now? Uh, I'm just about to take 400 milligrams of HDL and I'm chucking in uh, 200 milligrams of TA as well. The the, the alkaloids. Just for just this 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 is just for the initial one to try and get me up a bit yeah. up a bit, and then after that I'll be doing tiny doses all the way through. This yep. was the real start of the treatment. Sid had taken a stronger dose of ibogaine, mixed with the more raw form of the drug, iboga. 
64, so my heart rate's definitely dropping. What's your heart rate? Yeah, it was 74 this morning before anything. An hour, uh, an hour or so ago it was 68, and now it's 64. 64? Mm. So it's dropping. So that says 120 over 65 and 57 pulse. Yeah. How are you feeling? Oh, hi. You actually are okay. I'm fine. I'm, I'm I'll put these into the graph, okay? I can feel, um, uh, when, I, when I close my eyes, I can see visions. And... It's not disturbing you? No, not at all. They're very. Really Good. It's like I keep getting the same few things coming into my vision. Are they are they abstract or do they mean anything? They're totally abstract. Totally abstract. But they've um, they seem to be telling me that I'm safe and I'm loved and I'm alright. Oh really? Mm. What do you? Uh, Three hours into the treatment, I give said his next dose. This water. Have you got water there? Yeah. You got some there. Oh, there they go. Oh, I'm directly involved in this here. Um, I just need, um, I don't know what I need. Yeah, you're getting confused. Yeah, really confused. You need to do this yourself, though. So mm. I'm putting it in your hand. Can you feel that? Oh, yeah. Cool. So, well, it's three o'clock now. Yeah. It's three o'clock, so it's three o'clock. Another, another 200 milligrams of HCL I began. Mm. So there I was, acting as Sid's iboga provider. Okay. I knew what he was going through, and I knew the dangers involved. It was going to be a long night ahead. Under the influence of iboga, the addict usually yeah. suffers extreme ataxia. It's like being incredibly drunk. Take your time, my friend. Okay. Yeah. That's exactly what I was like. It's kind of there, is that alright? Look. Oh, I can't focus. You've, yeah, got, well, you've got like 20, 20 fingers. I don't know, I don't know what, you're ter what you're tearing at. Uh, <laughs> really, you're... Oh, fucking your face. <laughs> That's what I am. <laughs> I've been keeping an eye on Sid and his statistics. I seem pretty good. I've got... We've got to give him... 200 more milligrams in uh, about an hour's time, I think. And it should be well underway with the experience by that time. He seems still quite lucid enough to chat to. Uh, he's definitely tripping on the stuff. Um, no signs of withdrawal. And it seems to be going very well at the moment. Can you get that in? Give me that. It's 52 now. That's pretty much the bottom you can go at, it's 50. Yeah, well, it's not there yet, but listen. With his heart rate continuing to go down, I knew this was a concern. It couldn't afford to go much lower. How are you feeling? Is it good or bad? 
before it go to bed. The experience, are you enjoying it? I wouldn't say I'm enjoying it. <laughs> but, um, it's bearable. It's bearable, it's fine. It's better than morphine withdrawal. Oh, uh, it's many times better. No, not for you. No, for me. Yeah. Put it in your mouth. You're going to be able to do this since you can coordinate, can you? Fifty beats a minute. That was as low as we thought was safe. Anything lower than this was going to be a real problem. You're down for another one at midnight. Your last one. Do you think you need another one? Do you feel any withdrawal? No. Well, I think you should leave it off. I think you should leave off the... Because look, your heart. I'm just a bit concerned because you've got a low uh, pulse at the moment at 50, and we can't afford to go under that. You know that. So it's your treatment, but I suggest that we leave off that other capsule of ibogaine just now. Right, it's, uh, it's the end of day one for Sid, and he is sleeping soundly. No twitching on his legs, as far as I can see. No withdrawal symptoms. It's well into the next day, and the treatment is still continuing. Yeah. 2.15 on Friday. I can see you're tired out. I thought he's lost it. He's lost it. That's part of the process, isn't it? With the Ibogaine. Yeah. Two days after the, um, your last morphine and starting your treatment, you've mm. not withdrawn. And I think that's incredible. No, not you should be in a hell of a state. Oh, yeah, I'll be at the peak of it now. Yeah. You took some more iboga. Yeah. Alright, just be cool. My god. <laughs> Is that 47 beats? Yeah. Bloody hell. Well, you're still alive. <laughs> um, I was sort of told anything much lower than 45. Anything lower than 45? Yeah, 50 is like a like good, you know, you don't want to go any lower than 50. You just have, you've gone to 47. No, I have. <laughs> <laughs> Not, maybe that's why I feel like I haven't got any life in me. I haven't got any, um... Well, I guess it would, yeah. Slowing you right down. Mm. I don't think you should take any more ivy game right now, though. Mm. With his heart rate at 47 beats per minute, I really worried about continuing the treatment. Alright, mummy. <laughs> I'm alright. I got through it, alright. I'm struggling, struggling, struggling all my life with this fucking disease. Do not all I've tried to do is try and get clean and stay clean. This is so fucking hard. <laughs> you don't blame yourself. <laughs> I don't know what it was that started it. <laughs> I was just far too sensitive for my own good as a kid and a lot of shit things happened to me when I was growing up. <laughs> really screwed me. But, uh, Not 
lots of regrets and pain. <laughs> yeah. It's now five days after Sid had his last hit. With such a heavy habit, he should be in hellish withdrawal. Yeah, the fifth day after my last hit, yeah, I haven't had a hit for five days. Yeah. Um, uh, so I'm taking uh, I'm taking some mm, e extract boosters today just to keep the ibogaine levels up in my system and. Oh, can I see that? Can keep see? keep the cravings away, etc. It should. Although, although I'm not feeling any cravings, no withdrawal symptoms, nothing at all. I'm just taking it to be safe. So down the hatch. Down the hatch. Okay, well that's good. I'm uh, leaving you at that on day cool. uh, five after. Cool. Day four stroke five. It had been a textbook treatment, and I couldn't believe how well it had all gone. But I knew that the true test was in staying off for more than a few days. Sid's habit was a heavy Thank one. Thank you. Thanks, brother. Yeah. Oh, and I wouldn't have been surprised if he'd started using again as soon right. as I was gone. Cool. Cheers now. All right. Bye. Bye. So I pay him a visit several months later to see how he's doing. Hi, Pucky. Hello. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Pretty good for 20 quid. <laughs> yeah. 20 quid. Would have gone on a bag of gear. Yeah, no, you've got now you've Now I've got a helicopter. <laughs> I don't think you realise it at the time. <clears throat> it's like a, mm -hmm. you seem to think you're um, invincible, you know, injecting. You were in a really bad way when I first met you. And I'm really yeah. pleased that you've, you've stopped that habit and that's... Oh, I had to. Uh, but I don't, I don't think anything else would have made me stop, really. Although I didn't get all the visions and my life, my childhood kind of before my eyes and all that stuff, people would report. Like I didn't get any of that, but physically it took the, the withdrawal away. And then uh, afterwards it took a lot of cravings away. And my behaviour's definitely changed. Like I was really fiending for crack and snowballs before. I couldn't stop doing it. Like, yeah. Uh, and I don't want to do that anymore. I just don't. That, that urge to do that constantly is, so, is gone. It's just been a joy to see this happening. Cool. I'm really pleased. Oh, that's I'm really, really good. pleased. I'm good. really, really pleased for you, man. It had been a textbook treatment indeed. Sid was in a much happier place and looking forward to building a career in music therapy. Iboga is not an easy option and not the magic bullet to end addiction. But for people like Sid, the potential benefits outweigh the downside. Seeing how Iboga changed his life had convinced me more than ever that it can work. <laughs>